Well, if I can invite you back to your chairs. I always love the fellowship in our, in our break that takes place. Well, I have an honor this morning of introducing a speaker who doesn't need introduction as a friend. Um, Bart Lipscomb has been a faithful, committed member of our church since before its existence, which you might wonder how that's possible, but when we first made a decision to start a church in this area, I got a call from a man here that communicated how excited he was to be a part of it. Um, I had to inform him that we weren't going to be there for about another year, and most people, you would imagine, at that point would say, I'm no longer excited. Uh, <laughs> but he was. He and his wife, Jessica, remained excited, waited for us to come out, transition out with the team from Phoenix, Arizona, and then since that time have thrown themselves into the life of this church. What I love most about Bart is his humility and his gentle care for the members of our church. That's what you're most immediately aware of when you meet him. If you talk to people in his small group, they will communicate that to you. What you might not be aware of, what he does not put front and center, is that he is also a theologically educated man. He was theologically trained at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, a seminary that I have high regard for. And his humility is sometimes a mask for his wisdom and his intelligence and his gifting. And for all of those reasons, I asked Bart, would he be willing to reintroduce us to Ephesians and to speak to us as a church? Now, I know and he knows that he's speaking to his family, um, but I would be grateful if we could welcome him as he comes to preach to us. I, uh, I did email John before we, as, before the church moved out here. Well, as soon as I heard, actually the day I got an email from Sovereign Grace that said they were going to be planting a church in the Austin, Texas area, I, I immediately emailed John the next day um, and have been excited. And our family just reiterated back to you guys and back to um, the church family, just what it's meant to our family to be able to be a part of it. Um, to be involved in this church has been a huge blessing for us, and uh, we look forward to 2016. Um, and in that Happy New Year, um, if you made it to midnight, I hope you have recovered. <laughs> it, uh, if not, take a nap this afternoon. Um, and for those of you who I haven't had the opportunity to meet, uh, as he said, my name is Bart Lipscomb, and I get the opportunity and the privilege to serve as the children's ministry director here on a week-in, week-out basis. And uh, just for, I'm going to be selfish for just a second and steal an opportunity to say thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our children's ministry workers and those who serve faithfully week-in and week-out. We couldn't do what we do without you. It is a vital part of our church, and uh, it's ongoing even now. Um, and we just want to, we lift you up in prayer. We just want to say thank you to you. Um, it is our tradition as a church to begin the first Sunday of every year preaching a sermon again, reminding, being reminded again of our dependence upon the Lord, of, of our need of the Holy Spirit's activity in our midst. John prayed for it this morning. It's our tradition to, to take some time and look and refocus again on prayer. So we did that two years ago, we did it last year, and we're able to do it again this morning. And it's also our custom to preach our way through a book of the Bible. And if you've been with us for several months, you've seen that we, John and Aaron have led us through the book of Ephesians. And this morning, those two come together as we dive back into Ephesians. We just so happen, I don't think it's a coincidence, to dive in right where Paul is praying for the church in Ephesus. And so if you have your Bible, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to be looking, uh, reading verses 15 through 20, but primarily looking at verses 16, the second half of 16 through 19. That's where our focus will be this morning. And immediately as you get to Ephesians, if you're new to the scriptures, it's about four-fifths of the way through your Bible-ish. Um, but immediately as you get to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15, you'll see this little phrase. It says, for this reason. One of the blessings of getting to preach through a book of the Bible is when you see something like that that says, for this reason, 
you've already been a part and you've heard some of the foundation that Paul has laid previously in the previous verses. John mentioned this several weeks ago in his message. In verses 3 through 14, he has just begun, and it's one long sentence in the Greek, talking about, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And then he goes through all those spiritual blessings and how eventually it came to you, um, the church in Ephesus. We have obtained an inheritance, all these things that we've been given in Christ. And in him you also, he says in verse 13, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So you have received the Holy Spirit. And so he begins this text this morning, and I want to read it, and you can read, follow along with me. With that as the backdrop, that's the, ch the church has just heard that message, and now he's beginning to move on and saying, for that reason, because of all these things that have been granted to you in Christ, and because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might? We join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you that in eternity past, you chose to bless us in Christ, that you sent your Son to live a life that we couldn't live, to please you in a way that we would never be able to. We thank you that he willingly laid down his life for us as a substitute. We thank you that he came back from the grave three days later and that he is even now ascended in heaven making intercession. We thank you that you sent your Holy Spirit to unfold your word, to reveal the glory of Jesus Christ, to persevere us. And Lord, I just pray that even through your word this morning that you would be doing that now. That you would connect us to your eternal story of salvation this morning. That you would open our hearts that we would receive the truth and the reality of it. We pray this for the glory of your son, Jesus. Amen. I read a story recently. Um, the story was actually from 2011. It came out of Salt Lake City, Utah, and it was a private investigator, and as hard as it is to imagine, he was having to track down a guy who was living on the streets who had a large sum of money in his name. His brother had passed away um, and had left him a huge inheritance. Now, his family had been trying to reach him and communicate this to him and say, hey, there's all these resources in your name. You don't have to be living on the streets, but they weren't able to really connect with him. So they hired this private investigator, and the guy, I don't know how long he spent, but he tracked 60, he said between 60 and 70 leads that he had to track down trying to find some credible information to find this guy. Well, he finally finds him, and the guy's uh, kind of sitting on a bench, he said. Uh, all of his belongings were in a, in a shopping cart there. And uh, he, he, he approaches him, and he has to begin to explain to him and convince the guy and make him aware of, you're, you're actually a pretty rich fella. Your, your life's fixing to be different. It's going to be changed. Um, you're not aware of this, but you have a vast, and they wouldn't give an exact amount, but you have a, all, the, all the guy would say is it's a lot of money. You have a lot of money in your name. And he said the guy was just kind of taken aback and just kind of overwhelmed him about, man, I, and, and like I said, as hard as it is to imagine, the fella apparently was rich and didn't know it. Well, Paul, this morning in his prayer for the church in Ephesus, is saying, I've just finished explaining all these things that you have in Christ. You've been given all of these things in Christ. Church in Ephesus, because I've seen your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and I've heard the evidences of your love towards the saints, you're showing that life. I believe that these promises are true for you. You have these things, and yet what I'm praying for you is that you would know them. Two things kind of flow out of Paul here. John mentioned it several weeks ago, a gratitude for that, a gratitude of seeing that in a life, and then a prayer that they would begin to understand and realize and know that they know the things that they've been given in Christ. In fact, I think that everything hinges on a, ver a phrase we'll look at in a little bit, but it says that you may know, that you may know. A few things that in, in just reading this passage that immediately kind of stick out about, about this prayer. One is it's not a generic prayer. And 
how oftentimes uh, it is encouraging to have someone come to you and say, hey man, I've, I've been praying for you. I hope you've had that experience where somebody's come to you and said, I, Lord put you on my heart. I just want you to know uh, this week I've, I've been praying for you. How much more encouraging is it to hear someone that says, I've been praying for you over and over and over again. I've consistently been praying for you. It wasn't just a one and done kind of thing. I prayed for you and God's just kept you on my heart, man. I've just, I've been praying for you. But even more than that, how encouraging it is when somebody comes specifically and says, here's the specific request that I've been praying for you. I mean, that just, oftentimes, that's super humbling for me. Um, when someone comes to me and says, I've been praying for you, I've been praying for you continually, and oh, hey, by the way, it's been this specific request that I've been praying for you. Imagine the love and the care and just the labor that that is and being communicated to the, to the person who's receiving it and to the church in Ephesus. Imagine them hearing this from somebody they love dearly, probably, who they are aware is in prison in Rome, and he's writing them saying, hey, I'm praying for you, and I'm praying specific things for you. I want you to know. It's not a generic prayer. It's also important, we take it for granted, at least I did, until I started reading it, who it's addressed to. It is addressed to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. My, his prayer, Paul's saying, my prayer is to the, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who is the Father of glory. That title, connecting him to the God of the Hebrews, the Father of glory. That's not irrelevant for the church people in Ephesus, because if you kind of put yourself in their shoes, uh, in Acts chapter 19, you get a little glimpse of their worldview. Artemis was the Greek goddess of the day, and she was a Roman goddess, um, and she was the one that everyone worshipped. In fact, the, there's no small disruption that was created when Paul showed up and started preaching about this father of glory, this eternal God who is over everything. In fact, there's a silversmith who made all his money selling little shrines to, the, the Greek, uh, the, to Artemis, um, and, in, and you had to go to her temple, and they were making quite a bit of money off of it. And the idea was that you had to obviously pay some sort of uh, uh, amount of money to be able to be heard by her. And his actual words were, Paul's telling everybody that the gods made with human hands aren't actually gods. And that's dangerous. That's, that's going to be bad for business because we can't keep selling these things. Paul's saying, I'm, I'm, from, I'm in Rome, I'm in prison, and I'm not praying to Artemis. That may be who you grew up praying to. That may be the custom that you were used to bringing your requests before. But he's saying, I'm not, I'm not praying to that person. I'm praying to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Father of glory. It does no good to present a request to someone who has no power to answer it. It does no good to present a request to someone who lacks the power to answer it. And we know this from a very young age, right? My son uh, is a year and a half old, and he loves snacks. He is all about some snacks. All day, every day, snacks. He does not go to anyone but his mom with that request. Mom, snack. In the car seat in the back, snack. When you get home after supper, snack. And, uh, and he knows who to go to with his request. He knows who can answer that request. He might ask another child in the nursery for a snack, and they'd say, yeah, that's a great idea. Can't do anything for you. <laughs> but he know, we know this from a very young age. When we go in prayer, just a reminder again, Paul's saying, when I go in prayer, I'm going to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Father of glory. He is the origin, the source of glory. He is the one that we are praying to. He can answer our prayers. But when he comes to him, he doesn't immediately jump his request. He doesn't jump to the things that I would, by nature, probably move to. He doesn't pray for the life of the church immediately. He doesn't pray for their families first. He doesn't even pray about resisting the devil. Those are all crucial, crucial things. In fact, he spends chapters 4, 5, and 6 explaining and, and, and giving instruction on those things. They're vitally important, but he doesn't start there. In fact, he doesn't even go about asking for any additional stuff. He says, I'm coming before this Father of glory, and I'm not asking for additional stuff. You know what I'm asking for? That you would, it would be revealed to you, the Holy Spirit would reveal to you what you already have, which is quite a shift in thinking. Right, Because I immediately jumped from, okay, I know and I understand, I agree with all the things in verses 3 through 14. I agree that he's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. I agree that he's adopted us as sons through Jesus Christ. I agree about the inheritance. I affirm all those truths, and then I go straight into, well, now i got to go live this out. Paul's saying, no, 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 I pray that you may have a spirit. And from this context, we think, I believe it's the Holy Spirit he's talking about. I pray that you would have the Holy Spirit give you this wisdom and revelation. 
Wisdom being a, a right thinking about who God is, not the way that our sin-bent hearts tend to view God oftentimes. The way that, the, the, uh, as a cold, calculating, unloving, ungracious father. No, 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 a wise, loving, caring father. Wisdom, that he would give you a spirit of wisdom, that he would give you a spirit of revelation. The idea of kind of like an art opening that people go to to see a masterpiece, and they, it's behind this veil, and people are wondering what it might look like and what it may be, and then all of a sudden it's just un, unfolded in front of them, and, and the awe that that is. It is a spirit of revelation, and it's not just a generic knowledge. It's not a distant knowledge. It is the knowledge of God himself. If you look with me down in verse 17, it says, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in what? In the knowledge of him. The most important life-giving, soul-satisfying knowledge available. The knowledge that actually is life. Only God can reveal the greatness of God. It's not a wisdom and it's not a revelation that people can conceive of and write down. Only God can reveal the greatness of God. Not even Paul. He can give the information, but he can't give the revelation. And so he says, I pray. I pray that the Holy Spirit would be acting, giving you. And, and notice this kind of knowledge. It's not a periphery knowledge. He goes even further. He says, having the eyes of your heart enlightened. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened. It's not a periphery knowledge. It is a knowledge that even gets down into the very depths of who we are and our decisions and everything else. The, the eyes of our heart being enlightened. One of the examples that I could think of and just relating to this, I, I grew up uh, and I still to this day love to fish. It uh, doesn't mean I'm good at it. It just means I like to fish. And so every opportunity I have, I go, and I was, I was a bass fisherman. That's what I did. I mean, I, and I knew I was aware of fly fishing. I was aware it was a thing, and it was, it's a valid form of fishing. I affirmed it. said, okay, people can do that. It's just not for me. I don't really like it. Uh, I, like to, I, like to, I like to bass fish. Well, a friend of mine several years ago said, hey, come on, let's try it out. I went, let's go see it. I was like, I don't know, man. Okay. All right. And he didn't tell me any new information about fly fishing. It, look, it looked exactly like they show in the movies. So I get out there and I started playing around with it. I was like, okay, this is kind of fun. But the moment I stepped into the river and I, I remember hearing the sound of the rushing water around me as I walked down in the river, I remember being able to see, just think about what was going on underneath the surface and just getting to enjoy being out in God's creation and in, in nature and just getting to see it. And it was like I it was like I saw it a whole different way. Fly fishing meant something completely different to me. And it was like the eyes of my heart were enlightened. And I thought, man, this is actually pretty cool. I like this. And it wasn't, again, it wasn't any additional information. It wasn't anything that I didn't know before. But the I, this, it was just this aha moment where I was like, oh, I see what they're talking about. I see why people love to do this. And, I, and that's just a small, tiny, pathetic example of what Paul's talking about here. He's saying, okay, you may know all these things about, about who God is, and you have all this knowledge, and you have all the right answers that people ask you. But what I'm praying for here, church in Ephesus, people that I love, I'm praying that the eyes of your hearts would be enlightened in the knowledge of him, that you would see him, that you would enjoy him, that you would delight in him, that there would be something new, that there would be something that you're like, you know what, I've heard that before, but now I hear it. I knew that before, but now I know it. I enjoy that. That is a masterpiece. I do understand what, what he's talking about. I pray, church in Ephesus, that you would have the eyes of your hearts enlightened. And he's, he's praying this towards a purpose. He's, he's going somewhere with this. He said, I'm praying all these things, not just, uh, there's an ultimate aim, there's an ultimate purpose. And he says, I'm praying these things. So, and this is the, the phrase that I mentioned before. He said, I'm praying all these things. If you look there in, uh, in verse 18, it says, in the middle of it, it says, I'm praying these things that you may know. That you may know. And then he lists three things. That you may know these three things. You may know what is the hope to which he has called you, that you may know what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and that you may know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. And we'll take those one at a time and take a few minutes to kind of unpack each of those and what he's praying for them. 
but it is first the hope to which he has called you. I'm praying that you, the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. In the Christian classic uh, Pilgrim's Progress, two pilgrims are on their way to the celestial city, Christian and hopeful, and somewhere along the way they spend the night where they shouldn't and they're captured and put into a dungeon. The giant that runs the place is known as Despair and his wife is known as Gloom. They spend Wednesday night there being beaten and told by Despair and Gloom that they shouldn't live. There's no reason for them to continue on in life. They spend Thursday night there being beaten and, they, and it's just a miserable existence ongoing Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And they're, and they're actually contemplating ending it all because at some point they can't go on this way. They can't continue living this way. They're in chains. And then on Saturday night, Christian goes, aha, I forgot about this. I don't know why I've been so foolish. He says, I have a key. I have a key that I've been carrying with me the whole time. It was given to me at the cross, and it's the key of promise. And whatever chains of despair are holding us in right now, I'm pretty sure this key can unlock it. It's this hope. So he pulls it out, and what do you know? It unlocked the key. It was there all along. It was there for their use all along. It had been given to them. They'd been instructed it in what he's saying. It, but he had to remember. He had to know, oh yeah, there's hope here. There's hope. That's the hope that Paul's talking about. It's hope that allows us to live in a world that and oftentimes is chained in a dungeon with despair and gloom and continue on. It is a, it is a hope that, that surpasses all the counterfeit hopes of the world that, that so oftentimes people bank on, but they're not quite sure if they can really depend on it or not. That's not the hope that Paul's talking about. In contrast, the hope to which you are called, to which Paul is talking about, is the hope that is unfading. It was there before God said, let there be light. It is unchanging. It will not, in, in, in the end of your life, it's not like it's going to be different terms than it was at the beginning of your life. It is secured by Christ himself. If he could fail, then the hope could fail, but he cannot fail. It is a hope that will persevere you. In Hebrews 11, we see the definition of faith. Is faith is the assurance of what things hoped for. It is not a hope like, oh, I hope it'll work out. It is a hope that is known and is sure and can be we both meant to be aware of in our day-to-day -day life and relied upon. Paul's praying, I pray that you would be aware of this hope, that it would be real to you. It is an objective hope, not depending upon you, but your hope is based on it, and you will forever be able to rely upon it. I pray that you will know the hope to which he has called you. Secondly, I pray that you will know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. I pray that would be your experience, church in Ephesus. It, for, as as John mentioned before, and as we see here, it is God's inheritance. It is ultimately all belongs to God, but there is a richness about it of God choosing the saints to be his inheritance that we can benefit from, that we overwhelmingly benefit from. It, uh, uh, it has both a vertical component to it, and it has a horizontal component. It has a vertical component in that it gives us our value, our identity, and our ultimate end are found in being part of God's inheritance. Our value, our, when I say ultimate end, I mean our ultimate purpose. God has created us. He took the time to create us. He's sustained us to this moment. He's redeemed us. He's given us the most precious thing he could possibly give in giving us his own son. He's redeemed us so that the ultimate end, we would be his inheritance. That is, for whatever reason, God has chosen for us to be his inheritance. That's our value. That's our identity. And that's ultimately what our purpose is. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to question, well, why am I here? What's, what's my reasoning for being here? He's saying that the, this vertical component, that you would enjoy the richness of, that you would be aware of what that means for you and, what the, and, and that that would be a foundation in your life of your identity. It also has a horizontal component to it. As being part of our inheritance, we also inherit brothers and sisters in Christ. We inherit a place of belonging. We get to experience that now here in, in, in the universal church. I've had an experience, uh, been blessed to travel overseas, and I remember being in a church in Thailand, and we were seeing a hymn that was originally in English, and I was singing the English version, and, but there was very little English in the area, and they were singing it in Thai. 
but the overwhelming richness of being able to sing the same song to the same God together. The inheritance, the richness of that of universal church, but also of the local church. The richness of getting to sing with you on Sunday mornings. All of us be, being able to worship God together, having that in community um, as we come together on Wednesday nights. There is a horizontal co component. Church, I pray that you would enjoy the richness of the inheritance of, of God's glorious inheritance. Imagine as much as we enjoy that richness now, one day in the future when it will be free from sin and perfect. We can enjoy our place as God's inheritance and together. It is truly a glorious inheritance. Paul is praying, I pray that you would know the hope to which he has called you. There's a past component to that. He's saying, I pray that you would even now enjoy the richness of his glorious inheritance as a precursor for the things that are coming. And then he says, I pray, third, finally, I pray that you would know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. It's not a substitute power. It's not a, God says, I'm going to keep my power here, and you can have a, a secondary, uh, you know, here's the primary conduit, and I'm just going to give you a secondary version of it. No, he says, it is God's power towards us. It can't be exhausted. Can't use it today and then run out of it tomorrow. It can't be overcome. It's not going to be overthrown at any point in time, ever. It is God's power. It's active. It's not a power that is at rest. It's not kept in reserve. It is active towards us. It's active in our lives. It is enabling us to overcome sin. It is enabling us to have loving obedience in ways that we weren't able to do that before. It's enabling us to delight in things that honor the Lord. It enables us ultimately to persevere and to overcome the world. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. In 2016, you will have problems. Tomorrow, when you get up and you start whatever it is, it won't go exactly the way you want it to go. But take heart, take heart. You will not lose faith. You will overcome the world. Why does Jesus have this kind of confidence towards sinners who ultimately choose to doubt God on a regular basis? Why does he have this kind of confidence? He says, because I pray that you would know the power of God towards us. Finally, it will be present to raise those who believe in Jesus from the grave. If you look at the kind of power it says, it says, it is towards us, it's towards us as his church, as those who believe in Jesus Christ. And it's for us. And it's according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Jesus, when he came back from the dead, it was not just a spiritual sense, it was a physical sense. The power of God had the ability to preserve both his spirit and to bring his body, a glorified body, a better body from the dead, a body that will never die. That will be present in us as well. This is the power of God towards us. So Paul says, I'm praying for you, church in Ephesus. I'm here in prison and I'm praying for you. I'm not just praying once. I'm praying continually. And here's what I think is most important. Here's what I want you to know. I'm praying these things. I'm praying that you may know these things. From that, we can also say, church in Round Rock, I'm praying that you know these things. I'm praying these things are real. They're revealed to you. The Holy Spirit is active even now opening these things up to you. Why do we need to know them? Why is it such a big deal to Paul? Why do we need to be assured of them? Why do we need to know that we know Because the one who knows he has the real thing doesn't have to spend his life chasing a counterfeit version. The one who knows he has the real thing doesn't have to waste his life chasing a counterfeit version. If you own a bunch of real diamonds, the counterfeits begin to lose their luster. As the hymn says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. And the things of this world will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. As we enter 2016, as we begin a new year, a new emphasis on prayer, a new dependence upon the Lord, let's take our cue from Paul. Let's don't go straight immediately to the accomplishing, the doing. Our New Year's, it's a new year, it's a new you kind of mindset. I'm, here's the things I'm going to do. And here's the things I'm going to accomplish. Don't jump straight there. 
Those things, are, I'm not saying they're not important. They're important. But don't go straight there. Let's pray. And then let's pray. And then let's pray. Let's continually pray for these things to be true of us. Pray for our hearts, our own hearts. Lord, help me to know. Lord, when I'm, when I'm reading your word, will you open it up? Help, help me to see the richness of, uh, of the hope to which I've been called. Help me, to, help me to understand and reveal to me the certainty of it, the hope to which I've been called. Lord, show me the richness of the inheritance in the saints. Show me what it means to be able to look to the future and, and anticipate it and desire it and to be able to, and be, be able to have an ultimate end even now that I can begin serving that purpose. Show me that. Show me what it is to see your power at work in my life, in my family's life. Show me what it is to know that it is towards me, it is for us because of Jesus Christ. Pray these things for our own hearts. Pray these things for your family. May this be true in our family, our kids. This, may this be what they grow up knowing. Pray this for your small group. Lord, would you build us together as a small group? Would you build us in this way that we assure each other, that we grow together, that we remind each other of these things? And then let's see in confidence, in, in, in assuredness of what God can truly do in our midst. He's not a God who is far off. He is revealing the knowledge of himself. He is a God who is near, who will be with us in 2016, who will guide us, who will answer these prayers. And it's ultimately the reason he'll answer them and why it's so vital is it will be to his glory. It will be a church and a group of people who are saying, look at what God has done. Look at what he's given us. I just can't help but talk about the things that he's revealed to me. When we see something great, we want to talk about it, right? We want to glorify it. When I came back from the Grand Canyon, I told a lot of people about the Grand Canyon. Reveal these things to us. Paul's saying, church in Ephesus, I pray, before I get to all this other stuff and doing, I pray that, that this would be true of you that you would know these things. First and foremost, before we jump into the doing, I pray that you would know these things. I pray that all the doing would be built on, hey, I know these things. I pray that that revelation would come over us. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, that is our desire. We are your church. We belong to you. We were blood-bought. We believe in Jesus Christ. We do have love for the saints. Lord, I pray specifically for my own heart, for our family, for our church. Lord, I pray that we would know these things, that you would allow it. Your Holy Spirit would be active am among us this year, revealing uh, a spirit, giving us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and knowledge of you and of your son, Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that we would know the hope to which we are called, that we would be more assured of it now than ever, that we would, we would look forward and be excited about the glorious inheritance and being your inheritance in the saints. It would be a real thing and not just this idea that's out in the future that we would experience the richness now. Lord, I just pray for those who may be sitting even in despair, as I mentioned. Lord, I just pray that, that even now that the hope to which they are called would begin to release them and set them free. Lord, I pray they would know it. And Lord, I just pray for your power, your power to fall among us, Lord, to, to show the immeasurable greatness of how wonderful you are and that people would acknowledge that you are truly the real and living God because of the immeasurable greatness of your power at work towards us. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.